Hello friends, welcome or welcome back to another episode of Hyrule Comparison. This region contains the two bottomless pits found in Breath of the Wild, so we will take a quick peek down the chasms in this one as well. Because we went through the desert in the last episode, we're continuing the series by combing through the Gerudo Highlands. So bundle up or eat something warm, it's gonna get cold out there. Let's go. Starting with a comparison of the overall region, there's some overlap between the games with the highlands and the desert. Most significantly is the Karusa Valley pathway that I talked about in the last video that leads up to the Yiga hideout. Logically, it makes no sense how this area would be visible from the Wasteland Tower. Still, in the comments of the last video, you guys helped me realize that the most reasonable reason this section was part of the desert in Breath of the Wild was to encourage player exploration. You know, so we'd eventually make our way up there because it's a direct part of the main quest for Vodna Boris. In Tears of the Kingdom, you can beat the Lightning Temple without ever coming anywhere near here. The towers are located somewhat close to one another, but at much different elevations, with the Skyview Tower being up on Medela's mantle, and the Sheikah Tower stems from a gigantic, unexplorable void that players always wish they could explore. Well, now we can, so we'll talk more about these locations as we get to them. So now to get started with the surface exploration, we'll begin in the northernmost area and move southward. Doing this places us at the mouth of the Tanagar Canyon, which is part of the Ridgeland region in Breath of the Wild, but it's here that we find our first Gerudo Highlands area shrine in tears. The Gasass Shrine. <laughs> okay, it's Gasass, but I had to throw a stupid joke in there. So, am I your man, Mr. Dumbass? The name is Dumas. That's pretty thick-headed. There's nothing in this spot in Breath of the Wild. And moving east-southeast from here takes us to Lake Illumini, where yet another Zonai shrine stands, the Turakawak. Again, there's nothing found here in Breath of the Wild, which is somewhat unusual. Nearby in the forest, though, is a Korok in the exact same spot between games, but it's not the same Korok. A green one with a green leaf moved out, and a brown one with a red leaf moved in. Breath of the Wild has one of those run through the five flowers puzzles, while Tears of the Kingdom has you fitting a missing board to repair the roof of this little hut that it lives under. And the roof of this hut used to be completely missing, so apparently someone's been working on its restoration and left this one section unfinished, probably one of Hudson's employees. Backtracking west for just a moment between these two shrines, we find one of those giant skull enemy forts. It was in good shape in the first game with four lookout posts and a horde of bokoblins inside. It has since fallen into disrepair and two lookout posts have been removed and two moblins have moved in to account for some of the bokoblins moving out. Also, the treasure stand has moved from being more in the center of the fort to being off the side. So just some nuance changes with these guys. Directly south of here, finally heading up into the cold between Misathi's Shelf and the Cliffs of Ruvara. In Breath of the Wild, we find the Kihai Yu Shrine. But to find it, you have to shoot this cool design with a bullseye to the centerpiece with a shock arrow. In Tears, the centerpiece has been removed, and this is now where we find the entrance to Misathi's Shelf Cave. A simple shock arrow or electrically fused hit will not open the gate to the treasure. This one needs the power from Riju's ability to unlock, just like the batteries in the Lightning Temple. And heading west over the top of the Gerudo Summit, we come across the Gerudo Summit Chasm. While Link was adventuring around to save Hyrule from the Calamity, a treasure chest was stuck in the snow in this exact spot, containing a Radiant Shield. And heading a little further to the west into the Rizoka snowfield, we find a couple of Bokos chilling at the end of this rock pier formation. We can assume that they are the same Bokos that have been here since the Calamity. Of course, they've grown more prominent horns with the Demon King's presence, but they're dressed the same and look the same otherwise. They used to guard a Korok puzzle block, but now they just stand here on lookout. And dropping down from here, we approach the Otutsum Shrine in Tears of the Kingdom. And slightly southwest of here, we find the Kima Kosasa Shrine in Breath of the Wild. In each of these Risoka Snowfield Shrine spots, we see nothing where the counterpart is, a theme that's for this area so far. Heading north until we drop over the edge of the snowfield, we find the infamous 8th Heroine statue. 
In the first game, it was just like the other seven found around the desert, aside from having no symbol markings. But sometime over the last few years, someone or something has installed a gate blocking the entrance to a new cave where its face used to be, with a corresponding sunshine lock thing that requires a mirror to open. Once inside, there's a bunch of gibdos to clear out if you want to get to the treasure chest containing Tingle's hood. There's also a secret drop down spot under this mound of sand to the left of the treasure if you're interested in collecting the bubble frog. Shooting far east to the edge of the highlands border, we come to the Tamiyo River Cave. In Breath of the Wild, a Korok and a Rushroom were waiting at this would-be entrance, and heading inside and being at the end of a river, you'll notice that this is a dank, soggy, drippy place. Navigating around, you'll eventually encounter a gloom spawn, and if you look around enough, you'll find the phantom armor. West of here in this little cove of the Vitorsa snowfield, there used to be a boko camp in another giant skull. This skull has been completely removed, but there's a single rock where it once was. And a Korok feels safe enough to live under another rock behind here. Now let's talk about the Skyview Tower on Medela's Mantle, just southwest of here. We find a grassy patch and two bokoblins, each riding around on a bear hunting the wildlife. Approaching from farther away and watching down as they pop in, we can see that they spawn exactly where the Zonai Shrine will eventually be built. Then there's the Medela's Mantle cave entrance right behind here, which contains an underground river complete with a waterfall, and that's how we're able to access the tower our first time here. Honestly, the foundation of this tower is sketchy at best, and besides being helpful for players to know where to ascend, these support beams could be in place to keep the whole thing from falling into the cave river. We can head north of the tower back to the peak of the Gerudo summit where the 8th heroine's sword is still resting in the snow. Always a mystery as to how it got here in the first place. There used to be a white mane lionel not far off guarding this area, but now a frost gliox sits perched waiting to start trouble with anyone who dares to come near this sword. At the edge of Rudimala Hill, southwest of here, is another Zonai Shrine, the Mayamats, yet another utterly unremarkable location in Breath of the Wild, although I will note that Rudimala Hill only has this shrine in tears, but in Breath of the Wild had several treasure chests scattered across it and a Korok to be found. Just nothing in the same spot as the shrine. And now we can head south of here to drop down into the Carusa Valley, checking out this path towards the Eagle Lair. Not much has changed, they still roll boulders down at incoming company, and spilling sand showers are still pouring in the exact same spots. They might have added some more frog statues along the edges of the surrounding cliffs, I didn't count, but I did feel more like I was being watched as I ran through in tears than I did in the first game. The significant change here is that the Sheikah Sho Dantu Shrine with the luminous stone petal has been removed and replaced with a small boko camp with a cooking pot. Now of course you can disguise yourself as a Yiga member in Tears of the Kingdom and infiltrate the hideout easily. In Breath of the Wild, the door will be shut until you first head to Grudo Town and talk to Riju about the Thunder Helm. We see a different door between games. It was made of stone during the Calamity, and now it's a high security door with a little peep opening for the bouncer inside to screen visitors. The first room you enter still has the replica statues with the inverted Sheikah eye symbol covering their faces, but instead of a sort of storage room, this now acts as kind of the Yiga marketplace. As we enter through, the jail cell has no Gerudo Vi prisoner anymore, but there is a treasure chest inside, so while we couldn't get into the cell before, we can now. And I thought the way through was through this crumbled section of wall right nearby, but then gave up because it wasn't quite that simple. This big display where a Yiga is working on a vehicle used to be much taller with a patrol guard walking around it. And as we head down the stairs to the other side of this room, there's another Yiga working on a different vehicle who's in a friendly competition with the other guy. There used to be a guard blocking this next door who could easily be distracted with a bunch of bananas and a whistle to call him over. Heading through this door and up the ladder to the upstairs storage room where a convenient pile of bananas used to be housed up here to help with the Thunderhelm stealth mission. 
and the hallway leading to this room used to be missing two panels, allowing Link to climb out and stay up top to avoid all confrontation. These panels have since been installed, and the room at the end of the hall now has a Yiga journal talking about their plans to reverse engineer the Thunder Helm and call it the Lightning Helm. This book also gives us Riju's first name, because apparently Riju is her last name. Her real full name is Makila Riju. Heading down into the main room, there doesn't seem to be any significant rearranging of the furniture, but the guard blocking our way to the back room is the most astute of all the Yiga bad guys. Even the Blade Masters don't know what's up, but he calls Link out for having his blonde hair sticking out, which doesn't match everyone else's. But once you prove yourself by whooping on a bunch of his clanmates and acquiring the Lightning Helm replica from the Blade Master, he will let you pass. A few guys are hanging out back here now, whereas it used to be a couple of treasure chests in an otherwise empty room, and they've installed a new back door too, like the front. Now it opens more like a typical door, but it used to be a secret turned to open wall panel that required Magnesis to move. In Tears of the Kingdom, their backyard features the newly formed Yiga clan hideout chasm and the Ratsumamu shrine. This is where we'd fight Master Koga until sending him down into the bottomless pit back in Breath of the Wild, and eventually throw a Sheikah Ball down there to reveal the DLC Kaihiro Mo Shrine. The Zonai and Sheikah Shrines here are close, but not quite in the same spots as each other. But taking a look in Breath of the Wild, we see that both spots are made of a darker dirt, which I found interesting enough to mention here, but I wouldn't call it a strikingly significant feature. The dark patch where the DLC Sheikah Shrine stood is still in the same spot in Tears of the Kingdom though. And since we can explore down the bottomless pit aka the Yiga clan hideout chasm now, let's take a quick peek to see what would have happened to Master Koga as he fell down there and the puzzle ball as well. There's some building supplies including a Yiga spike thing on the top shelf and the light route that corresponds with the shrine above, curiously I was not able to activate. I'm sure someone will let me know and I'll have a big facepalm moment, but as I produce this video, I'm chalking it up to something funky being up with this place, possibly a glitch with me running on 1.0. I'll do it again and maybe edit this whole thing out. Hey, so this is Editing Room Tony. I'll just let this footage of me trying to open this light route run. Um, yeah, so I already got this light route while I was playing casually because I figured I was never going to need footage of the depths while doing this series and so I already unlocked this one. Yeah, all right. Don't forget to click the dislike button and unsubscribe. <laughs> Heading east towards the Lapo Mesa, we find a Korok in the same spot in both games. In Breath of the Wild, it needs to be thawed out from a frozen chunk of ice. While in Tears, it's been bottled inside a hollow tree trunk that you need to uncork it to free. In Tears, the Korok is reddish-brown with a green leaf, while in Breath of the Wild, it was green with a reddish-brown leaf, making these guys opposites. The Ku Takar Shrine is just north of here in Breath of the Wild, frozen in an even larger chunk of ice, but there's absolutely nothing here in Tears. And there's yet another double Korok location southeast of here atop the Zerko Mesa. This one's somewhat interesting, as in Breath of the Wild it's a single rock to lift with a Korok living under it, while in Tears of the Kingdom that rock is in the same position, but now it's hanging out with a bunch of other rocks that form interlocking circles with one spot open. This is the only fill in the open rock circle Korok puzzle I've ever seen where the rock isn't slightly hidden away in the direction of the missing space, but instead it's right there slightly out of place. Kind of peculiar. Also there's an ice Lizalfos that likes to guard this spot in both games. It looks to be the same one, but he's more frosty looking in the first game. Now it's time to head west, bringing us to our first Dragon Tear memory glyph of the series. This glyph depicts Ganondorf and triggers the memory of the time when he played nice to get on King Rabu's good side but came off as a phony, disingenuous POS. There's nothing remarkable about this cliffside in Breath of the Wild or the exact spot the Dragon Tear is found. Getting into the grand finale of this episode, west of here is the site of the Shika Gerudo Tower, which stems from a bottomless pit. Players used to theorize that since it looks like there's sky down there, it was evidence of some kind of skyloft reference. Instead, we now see that it leads to the depths via the newly formed Berita Lookout Chasm. 
And again, since this giant hole existed in both games, let's take a quick peek to reveal where the Gerudo Tower used to be anchored. As we arrive, Link lands into a pool of water, and if you climb out and walk to the edge of the drop-off, we get a good overlooking view of the desert depths from here. Then there's one last Sheikah Shrine southeast of here, the Sasakai Shrine. It's unlocked by standing on this pedestal and shooting an arrow over the Gerudo Tower at certain times of day or night. In Tears of the Kingdom, there's another corked up Korok exactly where the pedestal was, and the heavy metal crates Link needs to uncork it are found right where the shrine rises up from the ground. Pretty cool. And thank you so very much for watching. If you made it this far, let me know if I missed anything interesting in the comments, and please hit the like button to let me know to make more videos like this. What region would you like to see compared or contrasted next? And of course, please subscribe to make sure you catch the next episodes when they drop. And until next time, stay cool, and always keep punching out there. Aloha.